Oh, hello. Good afternoon. So, uh, new economy shortcut. Uh, and we are very, very glad, and I'm personally also very glad to have with you, uh, Lord Richard, today at this afternoon. <clears throat> I'm, I've been extremely inspired by the brilliant book you wrote a couple of years ago in 2006, on, which was simply called Happiness, and that was something which was extraordinary in the sense that there has been a, a highly respected and conventional, let's say, economist working on something which is not GDP or uh, the conventional measures of um, well-being, but on happiness. And that was uh, something that has very much inspired me in, in the uh, following years. And so I was extremely happy to see that you have continued to do uh, work on it and have done sort of an update and extension of that work and published in the new book that has come out some uh, weeks or some months ago. And I will hand over now to Nicola Brandt, the head of the Berlin uh, OECD Center, um, to moderate the session. And um, I'm very glad, as I said, to have you here and uh, happy to follow the discussion. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, my name is Nicola Brandt, and I have the immense honor uh, to introduce uh, Lord uh, Richard Leyer today to you. Uh, he's a leading British economist early in my OECD career. I, um, I uh, got to know his work on unemployment and from there he moved directly to happiness research as a real pioneer, but um, probably also because he thinks that there's uh, a link. So uh, Thomas, you already mentioned the book. Happiness Lessons from a New Science uh, that was published some 15 years ago. Uh, but Professor Lyot is also co-founder of the Action for Happiness of the World Happiness Report and the World Wellbeing Movement. And today we are very happy that uh, he is going to introduce us into his new book, Wellbeing Science and Policy, where he looks into many facets of uh, his well-being work. And after that, we will have Alessio Terzi, who is a um, EU Commission economist and who has written extensively about both GDP and, well, about GDP as a well-being measure. And he will uh, be able to comment on what you are going to present to us in a minute. Uh, Professor Lyot, you, you have the screen. <laughs> I think you have to unmute yourself. Hi. No, it's lovely to be here and to have this chance of talking to you about this, because I think that we are living at a very interesting time with, of course, challenges, but also a huge new potential. Because for centuries, people have talked about the happiness of the people uh, as the best measure uh, of the success of a society. Uh, certainly back to the 18th century enlightenment, especially in my country. Uh, but it's not been possible really to apply this concept. The idea that we would judge a society by the happiness of the people, how do we know what it is? The idea that we should choose policies which produce the maximum happiness of the people. How can we do that if we don't know uh, what is causing happiness? That is all changing now because of the new science of, I will call it well-being because I think policymakers are more comfortable with this word, but it means the same as happiness. How do you feel about your life? Do you feel your life is going well? Do you feel good or, or do you feel bad? A whole spectrum uh, of, uh, of feelings represented by this uh, single variable, which can take different values, obviously, for different people and, and different societies. So how to maximize well-being? I just want to make four points uh, to get this discussion. So here's the first one, that we must have a single measure of benefit. Um, people I'm sure you've encountered saying, well, well-being um, is fuzzy, it's this, it's that, we don't know what it means. We have got to, if we want to use this approach at all, go for a single measure um, of it, um, and the best measure is life satisfaction. Um, overall, how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? Not to 10, 
naught meaning not at all, ten meaning very. Um, I think this is a, 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 a well-tried measure. It's been used for 50 or 60 years in many surveys. We know a huge amount about what determines it, but also we can see how uh, valid it is and how meaningful and how much information it contains by also looking what it itself is able to predict. So let's look at the next slide. See, it, it, it is just about as good a predictor um, of whether you'll be alive in 10 years time as a medical diagnosis. Answers to some simple question like that. It's a good predictor of whether you'll quit your job, quit your, uh, your marriage, your partnership. Um, it's also a better predictor of whether you'll vote for the existing government than the state of the economy is, or even your own individual economic state. So it obviously has a lot of information. Um, and of course, our interest is in it as the outcome variable. So let me just say a bit about why it is so important to have a single outcome variable, because the OCD, uh, as some of you know, uh, offers a dashboard. Um, and this is the most common approach to well-being, is these dashboards. Um, but obviously, if you are wanting to say this is the goal, uh, you, there can only be a single measure of it, which you're trying to maximize. Now, you could construct it um, as an index of the variables in the dashboard, but then you'd have to say, where do we get the weights from? And you'd have to get the weights from something which you thought of as being the overarching good, which was um, more important than any of the single items in the dashboard, um, and was able to say how important the different elements in the dashboard were. Item against indices. I don't think the public understand indices. I think an answer to a simple question, which incidentally people answer incredibly quickly in these questionnaire uh, surveys. Everybody knows how satisfied they are with their life. Uh, I think a single question is a, uh, a, a good way of thinking about this. And th in this book, the, the whole book is about uh, answers to that single question. And, and that, let me give you another argument for a single variable. Insofar as this movement, this well-being movement, has got a, 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 an, an opponent, <laughs> the, the opposite view. The opposite view is, of course, that growth is the criterion. A country is a success if it has a high GDP per head. Um, and I think it's quite difficult to displace a single bad idea with anything other than a single good idea. So I think that if we use this single good idea, we've got a better chance of displacing the bad idea. And if we say, well, we, we like well-being, and um, here's the set of things on a dashboard, and you can use your own weights and so on. It, we can't use our own weights. Policymakers have got to have a single uh, objective which they uh, are aiming at. Um, so that's the well-being of population year by year. Uh, and it's, it's, as probably most of you know, um, the, the, the most extraordinary survey of it is the Gallup World Poll, um, which looks at the well-being um, of people in every country in every year. So we've got an extraordinary understanding of the human condition the extraordinary spread between Scandinavian countries up, up in the seven and a half or, or more uh, out of 10 uh, and the backward um, conflict torn countries in, uh, especially in Africa, something like three, just a huge spread of human experience recorded in this one measure. Um, and that's where we should almost start our thinking about everything. What, what is the human condition? Go to the Gallup World Poll, uh, I would say. But then there's a second issue, obviously, which is not 
how are people living, the quality of their lives, but how long they live, the quantity of their lives. Um, so the second uh, topic, please, on the slide. Yeah, so we also have to obviously incorporate the length of the li of life. And this actually makes, uh, gives us a measure which is very similar to the measure which is used in a lot of uh, health service management, certainly in Britain. Um, the principle is that treatments um, must deliver enough quality of life adjusted years to justify the cost. Um, so if we talk about well-being years, um, which is uh, you know, the, amount, the amount of well-being you have in each year added up over all the years you have, um, that's basically uh, a similar concept and we're building on a well-established methodology we're not we're not going out into <laughs> in, into the bleak unknown we can't we know what we're doing when we follow this uh, procedure um, but with wellbeers of course we're applying it to a, the whole range of policies if we're focusing as i want to now and what i say on government uh, as the agent that is trying to Max that produce the conditions for maximum well-being. Um, we uh, are thinking of all possible policies and all possible people being affected. We're not just talking about health-related uh, quality of life, but overall quality of life. Um, so let's just think about the, the thing as a sort of mathematical problem. The mathematical problem is, uh, if we do it, uh, first this way the mathematical problem is to to produce the maximum of, of well bees now and in the present in the future um from a given budget constraint of the public sector and so how would we do that well obviously we'd look at all the possible policies that we could implement and for each one of them uh, we would be calculating the the well-being, the well-being impact per euro of expenditure. So next slide, please. This has got to be the test that every government and finance minister should be applying. The finance minister should say to somebody who is saying, please give me some money for, for this. Well, uh, what are the sum of well -beers? generated per unit of net cost to the budget. Um, uh, and this is what we're trying to um, persuade the British government to do. So you might know that we uh, may be going to have a change of government um, within the next couple of years. Uh, the leader of the opposition has promised that he will require the Treasury, Finance Minister, uh, to evaluate policy proposals from his cabinet colleagues um, by this measure, as well as the impact on GDP. Um, so that would be a huge step forward. Uh, and that this is something which I'm hoping within the next 25 years will become um, common practice around the world. But we first have to show, obviously, that it can be done and that it, it, it works. So finally, let me move on to a thought which I'm sure many of you have had. Is, is it correct just to add up the well bits like that? Um, or aren't we more concerned with uh, public action to uh, reduce misery than public action to increase the well-being of people who are already doing pretty well? Uh, and uh, I'm quite sure that most politicians would say that they were. The question is how to do that um, politically. And by far the most straightforward way to uh, approach this reduction of well being um, is just to look in particular for policies in areas which are accounting for the most misery that we have in our society. Now, I wonder, uh, probably everybody here in this audience has a picture of what are the features, the causes, the main causes of misery in our society. 
And I would say if you're a politician, probably most people here aren't politicians, but if, uh, if, if you talk to a politician, their picture of what are the main causes of misery, completely wrong. Uh, so there are many ways we could investigate this, but the classic way, of course, um, is to have a measure for everybody in a sample of whether they're in misery or not. Let's say, are they? Is their life satisfaction below a certain cutoff? That's, as it were, the, the left-hand side variable if you're thinking of equations. And then uh, on the other side of the equation are all the potential causes um, of uh, whether somebody is in misery or not. Um, so the top cause, these are all put in simultaneously. So all of these are the effects of any one of these things holding the other things constant. The, the top core independent cause of misery um, is simply the answer to the question, um, have you ever been diagnosed uh, with an anxiety disorder or depression? Just a simple question like that, which of course is, is, is slightly correlated with all these other variables, but not very correlated. Um, we all know mental health problems are spread uh, right across the socioeconomic uh, spectrum. Physical health, of course, is also important, um, especially in old age. Uh, then human relationships. So health first, mental and physical, then human relationships, having a partner, um, having decent relationships at work, of course, having work, which is uh, um, of value partly because it generates income, but also because it engages you with other people and, and purposeful action and, 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 and then income. So this is not just a finding for Britain. This is a finding that's repeated over and over again and you'll find it in books we've written um, covering Germany, Australia, USA and so on. Um, so this is one way of finding out what are the causes of misery. A typical economist way of doing it, you might say. But another way, more, more typical in sociology, I suppose, is just to ask people, what are the main things you worry about in your daily life? And su surprise, surprise, they are almost exactly the same as these in exactly the same order. And, and Questions like, sorry, not, not, not there yet quite. Um, qu questions like, uh, phrases like income or debt do not figure as a top worry. Um, this year may be slightly different. So I'm talking about data from pre-COVID, um, but um, it is really important um, that we get uh, income into um, it. it Proper, a proper perspective. Um, but why not ju jump, a, jump a slide? Just go, go to go to one more. There we go. So, as I say, income is typically around number six in the order of what you worry about in your daily life. And in these previous equations that I was talking about, in most countries, income counts for one percent of the variance of measured well-being. Um, Obviously, some of the measurement of well-being is, is, is erroneous, so it might be one, more than 1% of the true variance of well-being. But compared with all the other things that we put into the equation, which is only 20%, you can see that income is not, it's not, it's not a, in any way at all a proxy for well-being, but it is a very important variable. And the other huge finding of well-being science is that um, the impact of uh, income on well-being uh, diminishes very rapidly as you get richer. Uh, one euro is uh, much less important. One extra euro is much less important to you um, if you're rich uh, than if you're poor. And in fact, its importance is uh, inversely proportional to your income, which is a pretty rapid rate of decline and is the principal argument in favor of the redistribution of income. Okay, so let's go to 
uh, and then I, I think I, I should be stopping soon. Let me just go to some of the obvious priorities that are thrown up. Go, go back one, please. Some of the obvious priorities are thrown up by this analysis, mental health. So I've been involved in a program which used to be called IAPT, which was to make available to uh, everybody um, who suffered from an anxiety disorder or, or depression, evidence-based uh, psychological therapy. And it was done in a very systematic way and completely new service we created because existing services didn't really do it properly. Um, we trained a new workforce, we ran, rolled out new services in the, in the National Health Service, and we measured every person's outcome session by session. Um, and of course, we found that a lot of these people went back into work. Um, and the, the saving to the public exchequer um, was quite definitely more than the cost of the, the program. And I think this is probably true of most uh, of any any program rolled out for uh, anxiety disorders and, and depression. Of course, we'd like to prevent incidentally it's being used in seven other countries now this program. So if you're interested, do do pursue it. And if you write to me, I can put you in touch with the people who know about it. Um, well-being in schools, teaching life skills in schools, really important. Vocational education. In some countries, well done, but in my country, <laughs> uh, woeful. Elderly care, obviously, and then, of course, uh, over everything is climate change. Um, and climate change, um, if you think about it, it is only an issue if we think about things in terms of well being and start from the position that the well being of, of, of everybody is equally important or very nearly so, so that future generations count almost as much as present generations. We use a very low discount rate, much lower than the one which economists would use on, on GDP, um, which is one of the reasons why it took people so long to get around to climate change, um, because economists were using such a high discount rate. Okay. Um, let, let me just, since I think there are some economists listening to this talk, go on to the Next slide. Yeah, this one. Um, of course, we don't want to throw away traditional cost-benefit analysis. Um, uh, and, and of course, it is producing measures of benefit in units of income. We can turn those into units of well-being by multiplying them by the change in well-being per unit change in income. Uh, and it's very important uh, to do this, I think, uh, a huge amount. I, I have actually written a book about cost benefit analysis some years ago. <laughs> um, uh, it, it is this is the only way to evaluate many many kinds of policies. Um, but for the majority of policies, you can't use this method. That's why the well-being approach um, is so powerful. So let let me show you a picture of our book. Next slide. Oh, go on. Yeah, here's our book. Um, um, as Thomas said, um, <laughs> I've written a number of books on this subject, but this book has a different motivation. This book is uh, attempting to say to people, here is a new science, uh, and this is where it's got to, and this is logically how, how you should, should learn it. Um, and I think that this is an important step because th there are some courses developing in universities uh, on well-being, often very idiosyncratic, often centered on the articles of the person teaching the course. Um, but it's important that we, we do move to a situation if we want to establish this way of thinking, where there is considered to be a corpus and an understanding uh, of what the subject is. So that, that is really what that's about. Two more thoughts. Uh, incidentally, important statement there, it's available on open access. So you just have to go into that website and you can read the book, no need to get it 
from Amazon or anybody. I just want to make, make two points about the politics of, of all of this. I mean, we are trying to persuade governments to make well-being, people's well-being, their objective. A huge opportunity is coming up. Next slide. In the in the UN summit of the future, called by the Secretary General, and I, I just hope that as many governments and NGOs and anybody who can influence these things will be pushing for well-being as a goal of government uh, at that summit. Uh, one little thing that I've been involved with um, as part of such a campaign um, was at the World Happiness Summit, uh, Wohasu, uh, some of you have heard of, next slide please. Um, so yeah, the World Happiness Summit ha happened this year at Como in, in, uh, in March, and we launched this manifesto, which is really saying that now we can have, we can implement the 18th century enlightenment idea that all organizations and individuals have increasing well-being as their central goal. Um, and we, we are hoping a lot of people will sign this so we can show how many people have signed it uh, as part of the approach to this summit. Um, and we are going to have a big, hopefully, event next World Happiness Day, March the 20th, where we collect all these signatures. So uh, please also, if you don't mind, uh, sign this, uh, this manifesto. Thanks ever so much. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Lyot, uh, for this, well, thought-provoking and provoking in some ways uh, introduction to, to your newest book. And uh, I, I have to say it's really just an introduction because the book, you should all look at it, is very rich and uh, talks about um, where well, human nature, nature, nurture, that debate, how to measure uh, well-being and how to um, and, and how to introduce it into policy, all very complex issues. And I think those are uh, the ones that we can uh, talk about now in the debate. And unless you 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 have also written about well-being measures, you've written a book that's called Growth for Good, and there, and I think for you, so growth being economic growth, GDP growth. And uh, Professor Lai just uh, called this a bad idea <laughs> to look at that uh, as a well-being measure. So I think his thoughts must be thought-provoking to you. And I'm very curious to hear what, what you have to say. What is your reaction to what, uh, to what uh, Professor Lai just uh, discussed? Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, for, for the introduction and for, for having me um, here. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Lord Lyard, for for the introduction. One of the things that uh, Nicola did not mention, but because she didn't know, is that the first thing I worked on as a, a research assistant when I was a student, still uh, in my master's at the London School of Economics, I was helping a professor that was working on happiness and collecting uh, happiness indicators or data. Uh, that might have been assembled uh, by your associates in some way. So uh, it is a good uh, way of closing the circle. Um, thanks a lot also for, for giving me the opportunity to go through uh, your book. That is something I would recommend to really all <laughs> those that are uh, well listening and working on these uh, on these issues. It is, um, it is a very well-written book, uh, perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, but it is neat and it is simple uh, to follow. So it is, uh, I believe, for a wide audience, and this is probably something you were aiming for, and I would say uh, students in particular, um, and policymakers. And it is, not any, it is not an economics textbook, it is not a happiness textbook, strictly speaking, it is very broad. I think, again, this is something Nicola hinted at. It draws from history, it draws from sociology, from psychology, from economics. And I think this is really something that uh, we are increasingly uh, feeling is needed, and so is very is very welcome. And indeed, you were mentioning that more and more courses are looking for books, uh, uh, and courses on uh, or, or students are looking for courses on this topic. I hear a lot of that of my students as well that are constantly asking me about uh, about the 
having more on happiness or going beyond GDP. Um, and I think that is uh, the, the only crucial point that I think is, is important for me to mention, um, which is that perhaps to your surprise, I, I very much agree with the, with, with the framework that is laid out uh, by, uh, by Lord Lyard in, in his book, in the sense that there is a recognition that we're not doing growth for the sake of it. And that what matters is achieving a broader goal. This is something that already Thomas Jefferson was, was mentioning uh, with having well-being as the overarching goal of, of government. And, and I think the question is, how do we get there? And that is the fundamental point, which is to say, I believe that what the book does and decades of work uh, of, of Richard Lyard to do is to organize thoughts about these objectives. And so to, to spell out things that are perhaps in the back of our minds in terms of what matters, what contributes to our well being, but they do so in a more scientific way, it, having a framework, which again I think is the greatest added value of this book, including for policymakers um, that are in, intuitively know that some of these things do matter, but here they are organized which is also a word of caution I would express towards those that look at these efforts to go beyond GDP as some sort of kumbaya, nice thing to have type of thing. Whereas this is the future and what we're trying to do here is to do it in a, in a proper way, in a good way and, and a, along a framework that is well spelled out in the book. And regarding the role of income and the role of growth and GDP, given you, you asked uh, specifically about it, I, I, I reiterate that I'm very much uh, in line with what uh, the book mentioned in the sense of saying, look, income does matter. So it's not like income does not matter at all. And growth does matter. It's just that other things matter as well. And so the key is to understand the trade-offs. I think is where the greatest value added of this approach emerges, which is to say, look, there are many things that matter, physical health, mental health, relations, a government, participation, uh, incomes as well, inequality in society and so on. But we need to, we, we intuitively know that, but we need a framework to look at these uh, and how to balance these things. And I think this is where the greatest value added of the book uh, comes. And so again, I, I can only salute this, uh, this effort. And uh, thanks again uh, for giving me the opportunity to comment on this book. Yeah, thank you very much, Alessio, for your thoughts. And 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 uh, yeah, I think I want to pick up something though. Uh, uh, Lord Laird, you said, um, well, this OECD approach of dashboards, that's not good uh, because you cannot uh, do a, a very compelling thought. You cannot uh, get rid of a bad idea or a single bad idea GDP with a host of uh, good ideas. Um, you didn't seem to question that all these different dimensions that well-being is multidimensional, so you said mental health uh, matters, uh, physical health matters, community, um, so being with us as partners, the uh, ships uh, matter, but uh, you think that you can all, you can express it all in a very simple survey style measure. So asking people uh, about their life satisfaction. And well, and what struck me is that nobody picks, seems to be picking up on that idea. So well-being, uh, well, beyond GDP is becoming more popular. I have to give interviews all the time about it. German government is expanding its, um, uh, its annual economic report with more indicators, but more indicators. And there are a host of OECD member countries who are trying to do cost-benefit analysis, but with non-GDP measures, well, other well-being measures, but nobody <laughs> seems to think that you can pick up all these different dimensions with this one measure. Um, why do you think it's possible? And if you think it's so simple, why, why don't people and policymakers understand it? You have to unmute yourself. I, I don't think that, that well-being is multidimensional. I think it's caused by many different things. And those things that you, you, you listed and are in the dashboard are causes of well-being. They're not measures of well-being. They're not con constituents of well-being. 
well-being is a rather straightforward thing. I, I think most people um, know how they feel, how they're feeling uh, about their life. Um, I mean, we can we can have a little discussion, but I don't think we should spend time on it. Um, sort of um, focusing, how much do we focus on how does a person actually feel from moment to moment? I mean, I think that we, we are all, we feel, our, fluct, our feelings, whether we feel good or bad, is going up and down all the day, like our temperature or our blood pressure. This is just a, a feature of human experience. Experience. But I think it's better to think not, not of just accumulating all those seconds, because we get too difficult to measure them anyway. But to think of it in terms of how do how does a person feel over a, a, about a sort of extended um, uh, 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 experience, certainly you know, nowadays, these are the sort of phrases that go into the question, as I put it on the slide. Um, and I think, again, um, it, it's it's not um, we don't really lose much and we perhaps gain something by saying not how do you feel but how do you feel about your your life these days I mean not not your whole life but your life now um, this is called in the distinction that Daniel Kahneman made the evaluative approach, whereas the one I started off before with like temperature was more the what he called the hedonic approach. But I think the dis distinction between them um, is not that that strong. Um, and um, obviously the evaluative approach is a lot easier. Um, and um, I think it also actually appeals more to, to policymakers. So, why do you, I mean, you're saying, is it possible? Well, I, I, people have no difficulty answering this question. How do you feel about your life these days? I mean, I think they answer in less than a second or something. It's, it's one of the quickest, when they measure the speed at which people answer questions, it's one of the easiest questions that people uh, find to answer. So I don't see, I don't see why there's a problem about it. Well, I have one uh, uh, it, it, very interesting. So, but what you haven't answered is, if it's that easy, why why haven't uh, governments picked up on the idea? And I want to, I think, add something to that question because I do remember a study, I couldn't find it when preparing on, I know that in these um, Gallup polls, I think, France always looks like a country that's absolutely miserable. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, working at the OECD, I've lived in France for long, and, and people do take it seriously. They do think that's real. On the other hand, there is some research, I think it's Alan Krugman, colleagues who've then taken another approach to asking about happiness, basically comparing uh, women in some American state and in Britannia, and then asking over the course of the day how they're feeling when they're commuting, et cetera. And there they find that there's no difference. And I think they came up with this said is that this that somehow the French do not use the extremes of the scale. So isn't there a risk, or maybe you're saying you don't have to compare across countries, but isn't there a risk that uh, in different cultures, people will answer the question differently? Um, is yes, I, I've, always, I've always been worried about that. And when I got into this, I was very excited by the work of neuroscientists. Um, who claim to be able to show a correlation between this is within the country, a correlation between what people say and various uh, measurements uh, taken in the brain. And I thought, well, um, you know, we can find out whether people are, are, are really differing across countries um, objectively um, by using these brain measurements, but it, it the brain measurements have not turned out to be as robust as was hoped about 15 years ago. So we haven't reached that point. But I think you know, we will, over, obviously, over the decades, move more and more to a, a physical basis for measuring people's ment mental states. Um, 
uh, and then the, the issue of language won't arise. But um, at the moment, the, the issue of language is, is obviously um, there. Uh, people have made some efforts to, to, to tackle it. For example, uh, Edward Dino, who's the founder of this whole subject, he, he got um, some Chinese American students to answer the questions in Chinese and, and in English, uh, and they gave similar answers. Um, people have also studied uh, the Swiss uh, communities that speak different languages, um, and, and they found that the, there's more similarity between the Swiss communities speaking different languages, whereas each language group in Switzerland uh, has a different happiness from the the language in the neighboring country, be it Germany, France, or Italy. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, this, this is not an adequate answer. Um, I think, obviously, always the fact that these measurements can be explained by the kind of things that you might think would explain them um, makes what makes them more credible. So John Helliwell, who, who's really the, the moving, the, the most powerful, most energetic uh, of the editors of the World Happiness Report and writes the second chapter. Every year, he is trying to explain the differences between countries by, um, I think it's six variables. And there are 150 or how many countries. Um, and the, the variables are obviously income and life expectancy. And, but then the um, answers within the survey um, on uh, freedom, uh, corruption, um, social support, um, and public spirit. And he's able with these six variables to explain 80% um, of this variation across countries in the way people answer, in spite of the fact that they're answering in different languages. So, you know. <laughs> It, it gives one some confidence that there's some genuine information content, but there may be some error also. Thank you very much. And uh, well, I, I want to pick up on another point that Alessio has made, because I'm, I'm not sure, I didn't understand the same thing as Alessio did, because Alessio that well, of course you're not, nobody is denying this beyond GDP community, nobody's denying the importance of income. Uh, people are just saying there are other things uh, that matter too. But the way I understood you is that you basically said income is somehow of minor importance, or it's at least not, it doesn't make the top of the list, right? So is that why you're saying GDP is a bad idea? Because otherwise, even at the OECD, we would say, well, many of these things you think of as well-being, health, education, etc., is after all quite correlated uh, with GDP or income. And you're saying, no, no, if you look at my measure of, uh, of well-being, it's actually of minor importance. Is that, is that what you think? No, I would never say, I would never say it's a minor importance. Um, and um, uh, I, I think that, uh, You know, anybody, anybody who said that would be completely lacking in feeling for people who are, who are suffering from from lack of uh, of, uh, of 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 income. Um, I I I think that um, we don't fully understand, obviously. Um, the extent to which other variables within the country, I, th I think we understand within the country pretty pretty well the role of income. I think we don't understand it so well across countries. Um, I mean, I've been reading uh, Darren Asmoglu's book about why nations fail, um, and it's kind of focused on income well, income is determined by governance and then income kind of sets the context for everything else, something of that sort. Um, I, I don't think we've got proper 
proper models, really, of the relation between politics and and, and uh, social um, cohesion and income. Um, so I think that's uh, that's a a, a a a difficult area. And uh, Marie Corman, so we have questions from the audience, and Marie Corman mm -hmm. has this question said, well, why not only use life expectancy to guide policy? And perhaps she's thinking about your, one of your introductory statements where you said this answer to the question, how do you feel about your life? Do you feel well about your life? Predicts life expectancy, how long you're going to live much better than than GDP. So is that another measure measure that could be used uh, or what do you think about that? I'm not sure I completely completely understood it. So could you say it again? She asks uh, the life expectancy, wouldn't that be the one a, a good measure? If you only wanted only one, why not take life expectancy oh, as a guide policy? Well, I, I, I mean, the quality of life is pretty important. <laughs> An absolutely miserable life, uh, however long, is not not that worth living. Um, so we should worry about it. Yeah. Um, perhaps I want to bring in Alessio again, uh, because I I think you have. Uh, so you have, as, as I said uh, at the beginning, you have written about uh, growth, growth for good, that it can be in many ways a good measure and guide. Uh, policy well, and that it's also sort of a, a reasonable uh, proxy for for well-being. Um, do you still find this idea compelling that it should be ideally replaced with the answer to this uh, question, how do you feel about your life these days? Would you concur with that approach? I I concur. That's a question to Alessio. <laughs> I concur in the in the fact that so let's say the way I look at these problems is the following, which is to say growth or GDP tries to give you a sense of the resources you can use to uh, achieve well-being, improving on the variety of indicators that contribute to it, uh, and there is a political process that sort of makes concerns about individual dimensions bubble up. And so if housing becomes an issue, uh, this will become eventually, whether you're in a democracy or an autocracy, eventually it will become something that you will feel social tension about and social pressure about. And so the interaction of a political process with uh, economic growth will lead to somebody making this a priority and investing resources into that priority and alleviating that problem. Uh, so this is, to my mind, how the overall process works. Now, within this context, if you have a framework that signals, that flags that something is an issue, so you measure it uh, systematically, and it flags, look, housing is becoming an issue, people are becoming really unhappy because of this, it is much better than having to wait for street protests for a political election, for populist movements to ride the wave of this or that aspect. And so having this type of approach helps policymaking. It becomes more scientific, if you want, more educated, more data-driven. Uh, so I think that it is not, let's say, a revolution in the way we do policymaking uh, since the beginning of times, but it is a def most definitely an improvement in the way we do policymaking rather than uh, wait for politicians to have a gut feeling that something is wrong on this and that dimension or for the political process to play out with a lot of uh, tension that might go with that. So is, the, is that, does this uh, idea appeal to you, uh, Lord Layers? And, and, and do you think perhaps connected to that, that cost-benefit analysis with the well-being measure you propose is entirely possible so that you can do the whole analysis like you would do it um, I don't know, with GDP, so uh, how different factors affect this uh, better measure of, of well-being. Is that what should guide policy? I'm sorry, as, as I said, there's a bit of an echo on, on you at my end. Could, could you say it again? Yes, uh, first I wanted a reaction to Alessio's thoughts, in particular, uh, whether you think that 
So your measure of well-being can basically be taken as an early warning ind indicator when it goes down. Then you can make analysis. What's driving it? Is it housing? Is it climate change? And can you then do cost-benefit analysis with your uh, indicator to guide policy to know well to let policymakers know what they can do to improve the indicator of well-being? Well, I mean, my hope, of course, is that it, that it will always be used uh, for cost benefit analysis. <laughs> that we will we will always be looking at at everything through the lens of well-being. But it's absolutely true, and and, and it, it's interesting, and you'll find it in the book. But well-being has proved quite a good indicator, uh, a predictor. That was, I think, what the phrase you were using, early warning. Um, in, in many countries. For example, if you look at the Arab Spring, you will see that although the, uh, in Egypt, the, the GDP was going up very fast before the Arab Spring, the well-being was going down very fast. And that should have given people a feeling that there's something, um, something else there other than income, which they need to, needed to uh, think about. Uh, I think the same, same was true in Hong Kong uh, before the disturbances in, in Hong Kong. So it, it, I think, I think well-being is a very interesting, um, not just a de de descriptor of, of um, how the world is at a point in time, the most fundamental descriptor of how the world is at a point in time, uh, but it's also a, a really important bit of history and I'm quite sure that, you know, like economic history is now largely written as a history of, of, of national income per head, living standards, um, and the causes of that. Uh, we, we will in due course, particularly as we get more and more uh, long time series, be writing about the history of countries in terms of the, the, the the history of the well-being of the population and that, that will be what what social history is about very interesting thought and i have another question for you from the audience jan prive is asking well shouldn't well-being indicators be goal oriented uh, should they, shouldn't they stand for pur purpose and then he worries uh, if that's the case, isn't a one-dimensional indicator too simplistic, not helpful, like GDP? That's his question to you. So, sorry, what was the first part of the statement? I didn't catch it. Whether well-being indicators should be goal-oriented, pur pur purposive, he says, so stand for a purpose, I suppose. Stand for what, sorry? For a purpose? <laughs> Goal-oriented, a purpose. Do, shouldn't they purpose. represent a purpose? Well, the, the well-being indicators we're using are experiential. Uh, they're how a person feels. Now, as you ask, how does a person feel? Um, I mean, one... Uh, um, important aspect of how a person feels is if they they are in pursuit of some purpose so purpose having a purpose um it, it is, is something which lifts your your feeling about your life provided that you've got a chance of achieving the purpose um i i think um one, one of the um the best uh, established causes of depression is actually having purposes which you can't achieve, having goal, unachievable goals, uh, either you know, career-wise or education-wise, but also in terms of your relationships with members of your family or whatever. Um, so purpose is important, but uh, you need a purpose which is achievable. That's very interesting. I, I have my myself, I have a question to, to pick up. On. So, of course, income, we established that income is important. Uh, but you also said uh, that, well, one, it's not 
one of the top causes of uh, of your well-being measure um but also that of course and it's well known in economics that the marginal utility of income goes down as income increases and that's uh, that you said is the main uh, justification for redistribution uh, and i want to just so why is it then so difficult to establish redistributive policies so if people cared about their well-being they wouldn't be so eager <laughs> to maintain very high incomes right how can you explain that in your framework well i mean what what, what, what redistribution happens depends on the power structure doesn't it um now uh the um the simple the simplest uh, theory of the power structure um, in, in a democracy um, is that the most powerful person is the person, the median voter, the person in the middle. Um, so they, they wouldn't want to, to lose too much of their income to the people below. Um, but they certainly might be willing to take away some of the income from the people above uh, to give it to the people below but the, the the reality i mean that's a very artificial um, stylized model um the reality is of course that money speaks and the, the rich have a, a lot more influence than uh, than the number of votes that they have um because of the way they can influence the media the way they can influence politicians by various forms of not direct bribery, but pressure of, 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 of uh, uh, and lobbying of various kinds. So I think, I think you'd have to say that well, pressure of various kinds um, uh, going with money is the main reason why we don't see more re redistribution. So it does make re you really very happy when you already have a lot of it, but you still cling to it, right? <laughs> um, so my final question, perhaps, because we are running uh, out of time is, so you, you've, you're not only a happiness scientist and uh, you did a lot to help uh, people understand the, how to measure well-being, how to understand the causes of it, but also you're sort of an activist. You wanted to be used in, in politics and you said the UN Future Summit is a very good uh, opportunity. How confident are you uh, that this will be taken up more uh, than it is today, that well-being will win, so to speak? Well, I suppose I would start from kind of where the Dalai Lama starts. Everybody wants to be happy. Um, so, when this becomes a subject that can be discussed in a scientific sort of way, just like wealth creation can be discussed in a scientific kind of way, um, it, it, surely, it surely will be of more interest to people. People more, want more to be happy than they want to be rich. Um, so, and parents want their children more to be happy than to pass exams or to become rich. So, it is the universal aspiration of mankind that we're talking about, but it's only recently it's become possible to have a serious, if you like, quantitative discussion about it. Um, but now that it is possible, um, I just don't see that anything can stop it, to be perfectly honest. I, I just think um, this will, you know, was thought to be a bit of a curiosity to start with, that, that then something which people found reason to object to and eventually it will just be part of the scene just common sense yeah well thank you very much lord Lyot. thank you uh, alessio and uh, all the discussions for for the the people who ask questions in the audience for joining in i think that's a very happy message uh, i usually uh, moderate panels where we start out by saying we live in a world of multiple crises and now uh, to to go out of this meeting with a message that happiness will win uh, is uh, is delightful thank you very much and uh, 
Yeah, perhaps but, Thomas is going to speak a final word. No, I just wanted to say thank you too, and uh, Richard Laird, excellent contribution. Um, I'm very happy to have this work around. Let's, let's keep uh, in touch and um, looking forward for the World Happiness Summit next year. Right. Yes. And uh, you know, thanks, thanks to all of you and uh, everybody out in the audience. Um, very lovely, interesting questions. Um, thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>